If you're looking into a processor, there's loads of references you can check out for performance breakdowns and stuff like that in order to determine which one is better. But no one ever really compares the difference in their stock coolers. So if you have an option between coolers, which should you choose? Let's find out. Also, stay subscribed for other seemingly random videos from Linus Tech Tips. Save on Intel 730 series SSDs during Intel's President Week sale, February 22nd to March 1st, 2015. Click to learn more now. So we started by sourcing the stock coolers. I acquired three offerings from AMD. A standard cooler with a copper slug in the middle, a standard cooler without a copper slug in the middle, and a heat pipe based cooler with a larger copper base. From Intel, I actually only have one cooler. It's their little one that they've been shipping for quite some time, which also sports a copper slug in the middle. For platforms, I'll be using a stock AMD A10-6800K and a 4790K. I'll be testing each CPU cooler on both CPUs, so the mounting is going to get a little bit ghetto here. And they're not super designed to go on each platform, so there might even be some modifications going on. To fit the AMD CPUs onto the Intel platform, all I really had to do was create two Zapstrap loops and fed them through the motherboard through the existing holes. And while this wasn't exactly elegant, I actually didn't really interfere with the cooler all that much and it was relatively easy to do. If you were to do this on your own, I would highly recommend a proper base and using the mounting hardware from maybe a different cooler and modifying it to your needs. The Intel cooler was a different beast entirely due to the clip-like feet. These feet stopped the cooler from being able to make a connection with the CPU as they stood off from the motherboard. Therefore, they were removed in the name of science. The Intel heatsink's fan clips on using the longer parts of its leg, which is an issue. But thankfully, the base of the actual metal where the copper slug is is actually taller than the rest of the unit. So the first thing I removed was the fan, mounting hardware, and the fan itself from the heatsink. Two of the mounting legs had additional clips for attaching to the heatsink, and two didn't. I completely cut off the ones that didn't have any additional clip and the other ones I removed the mounting legs really quickly and then shaved them down as short as they could go while still having the clip attached and still being strong enough to hold on. From there it was essentially the same as the AMD coolers in terms of mounting to the motherboard. So all the coolers are strapped in literally, and we're ready to go. The benchmark we'll use is IDA64 stability test, which, we'll, which we have set up to test the CPU, FPU, cache, and system memory. This test will be ran for at least 10 minutes or longer, depending on if the system seems to have hit a constant temperature or not, and each cooler and CPU will be wiped clean with 99% isopropyl alcohol and toilet paper before every test. I'm using IC Diamond Thermal Compound to remove variables, as I would only be able to use the stock thermal paste on these coolers once, which which makes it generally useless. The results were rather expected. Bigger cooler does better. And when size is similar, the ones with copper slugs outperform those without. And the bigger cooler with the most copper in it, and the one that also had, happened to have heat pipes, did the best overall. One thing to note is that the goal of this video is to compare the available stock cooling solutions, not which CPU has better thermal output. That's a different story for another time. In conclusion, the coolers are kind of made for what platform they're going on. But if you have an option between an AMD and Intel CPU cooler, regardless of your CPU, you should probably grab the AMD one. Either solution will definitely get the job done if you're just running it stock, but if you have the option, you might as well take it. This does draw upon another question, however, which I would love to dive into if you guys are interested. Is aftermarket cooling worth it for price per performance in early 2015? And if so, how much should you really invest? Let me know if this is something you're interested in over on the forum. While you're there, click the support us box link thing in the top right hand corner and change your Amazon links to ours. That'll help us out a lot, especially with the weird YouTube changes that are going on lately. You, you can become a contributor to the forum. There is some cool stuff coming for those guys soon. And if you're tired of the forum and don't want to be over there because you're done commenting, back on YouTube, subscribe, like, dislike, do all those things based on which cooler you like more. I'm not going to tell you which option to choose depending on that but you'll figure it out. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.